Welcome to this special episode of the Celtic Exchange where I'm joined by Josh McCaffrey. To those who don't yet know, Josh uh, focuses, amongst other things, uh, on his work at Celts are here on Celtic's youth and loan players. And he's here today to give us a bit of an insight into that and, and how that's all shaping up right now at Celtic. Josh, welcome to the Celtic Exchange. Before we get into the, the youth side of things and the, the loan players for a bit more detail, what's your take on how Celtic are doing in general at this moment in time? Very well. Uh, also one defeat in all competitions this season, so it's uh, it's going very, very well. But for myself, from a supporters' perspective, it's very weird to see Celtic doing well in Europe. Um, obviously, I'm only 19, so throughout my life, never really, or throughout my supporting life of Celtic, Celtic have never really done well in Europe. Um, so it's kind of uncharted territory uh, yeah. for a lot of people my age. Yeah, I think Asim touched on that last week in the podcast. So, uh, yeah, it's very good. Uh, obviously, Brendan's got the team playing very, very well. They're a well, well-oiled machine at the minute. Um, players on form, Nicholas Coon's playing well, everyone's kind of doing well at the minute and it's really, really good to see. I think it could be a special season. Could be. Um, you've maybe heard folks, Brendan, Rodgers included, uh, referencing the Leipzig victory as a, a generational result in Europe. So let me ask you, at 19 mm-hmm. years of age, mm-hmm. aside from the Leipzig uh, result and performance, what would be your standout in Europe so far? Is there many? Is there any? Yeah, I Think of two or three. Barcelona twenty twelve doesn't really count because I was seven years old. No, I'm not, not giving you that. Yeah, I'm not even at the game. So, I would go with either of the two Lazio victories in the Europa League, yeah. um, and the Leipzig victory in the Europa League, the two one at home where Keaton Tierney and yeah, Odson Edward scored. So, I think that's the kind of two standout ones aside from Leipzig. Um, yeah, the other and week. And is Leipzig now easily top of the tree for yeah, you? Yeah, this moment in, in terms of being at matches, um, result, top team, second in the Bundesliga. People will say they've. Lost all their Champions League games, but they're a top class outfit. And yeah. Don't let anyone fool you. So no doubt. Me. Do you think uh, Celtic can qualify? And if so, sh- should we dare mm. to dream and all that kind uh, of stuff? And, uh, and imagine what might be. Yeah, I was thinking about this. So for me, I'm just wanting Celtic to get top twenty four at the minute. That's my prime sole focus. And uh, I think I'm just so used to seeing Celtic capitulate against teams like Bodo Glimt, Ferencváros, mm. Cluj, and. I just wonder if that's going to be the case again. But with this team under this manager, something feels different in Europe for me this season. I don't know what it is, but they're playing well. They're getting results together against big teams and it's very pleasing to see. So I think if Celtic beat Club Bruges next Wednesday, then I think we can perhaps start to dream of top eight. But for now, like the manager's been saying, like the players have been saying, keep the focus on the top 24. But yeah. then once you get that 10 points, which gives you, what, 99% chance of getting top 24... Um, then I think you can perhaps start to dream. Yeah, do you know, Brendan does this very much uh, one game at a time thing. I, yeah. I'm going six games at a time. I like to look, a, look ahead and yeah. read chunks. And mm-hmm. I think if we can get the result against Bruges, that would give you almost certainty of the 24. Mm-hmm. And then who knows beyond that. Josh, you're, uh, one of your Twitter handles is Celtic YL Updates. Mm-hmm. And that's where you provide most of your updates on the youth and the loan players at Celtic at this moment in time. And I want to ask you just more generally about how things are going there so obviously mm-hmm. Celtic's B team under Steve McManus they play in the yep. Lowland League yep. against a variety of, of different opponents and alongside that they're now competing in the UEFA Youth League so they're playing against the, the Dortmunds and the Leipzigs and various other teams mm-hmm. what do you think of the, the Lowland first of all as a as a grounding for these players does it prep them well enough for the, the challenges of first team football at Celtic? Yeah I'm not entirely sure the Lowland League's obviously are playing against predominantly part time teams um, and Celtic are doing pretty well in it this season to be fair they sit fourth on the table they're only three points behind the league leaders East Kilbride who have a lot of money pumped into them I believe mm-hmm. and they've only lost one league game this season so okay. they're, they're coping pretty well at that level um, Who did they lose to? Do you know? Yeah I'm not entirely sure I think it was Caledonian Braves actually Caledonian Braves. I think it was quite a, an emphatic loss I think it was 5-1 to Caledonian Braves that day or something yeah. like that so that's the only domestic or league loss this season, sorry. Um, in the youth league, they've been doing pretty well. Six mm-hmm. points from four games. Two wins at home. Bratislava 4-0. Leipzig 3-2. And then they lost on the road to Dortmund. And then Atalanta uh, away. That was such a harsh defeat. A late mm-hmm. goal against Atalanta away. So, right at the death. Yeah, it was. Um, they're in a very decent position to make the last 32 of that uh, UEFA youth league. It's a slightly different format to the Champions League. Okay. So it's a 36-team league table. The top 24 then go into the last 32 with eight teams from the domestic champions path. Okay. Uh, so the next fixture, obviously, is Bruges at home. Mm-hmm. Then they've got Zagreb away. Then that ends the league phase in the youth league because uh, there's only six match days. So they just take the first six games. Right. Um, but in that competition, yeah, they've been coping pretty well and I would, I would back them to get into the knockouts. Yeah, so I, I happened to, to beat the Bratislava game, the mm-hmm. opening game. So they, they play yeah. in the same day as the first team do. So yeah. I was along at that at Lesser Hamden. 4-0 on the day. Yeah. Um, 
one player that stood out and I suppose one player that we'll focus on for a moment who continues yeah. to make headlines is Daniel Cummins he yeah. got two goals in the day I think Francis Turley who a lot yeah. of fans will have heard of now yeah. also scored and let me get the lad's name Samuel Isiguso Isiguso he got the fourth on the day yeah. an impressive performance an impressive result and as I say Daniel Cummins was the, the kind of figurehead for that yeah. one I've seen your own report on Celts are here that he's yeah. due to train with the first team mm-hmm. this week uh, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, pro- yeah, probably it. in there as we mm-hmm. speak what do you think of Daniel Cummins? I think as a fan and as fans in general we're all desperate for the next young Celtic mm. star to come through. I've seen yeah. some articles about is he the next Charlie Nicholas? Is he the next Jerry Craney? Is he the next whoever? From what you've seen of him uh, and it's early days he's 18 years of age has he got a chance to make it? Are you excited by him? Well, I think when you score the number of goals he has for the Celtic B team this season you've got every chance 20 goals in 18 games is, is quite a prolific return considering he only got 12 and 24 last season. Right. Um, so he's made a drastic improvement this campaign. Uh, he's currently with the Scotland 19s today as we record this podcast. They've got a game tonight. Um, but yeah, Daniel looks like a, a really good goal scorer, a goal scoring striker. Um, watching some of his clips actually recently and just the number of first time finishes that mm. he has is, is really, really good. He's he's clinical in and around the box. So I think he does have a chance of mm-hmm. making it in the first team. Um, obviously given that goal return and Brendan Rodgers spoke about last season Rocco Vata getting that third striker role maybe mm-hmm. that's something Daniel could, could look towards if they get his contract situation sorted yeah which leads me perfectly to the yeah. next question so there is a concern that he may take the route that Rocco Vata that yeah. you mentioned and Daniel Kelly have taken where they're on the fringes of the first team they're getting a wee bit of exposure yeah. and then they're gone yeah. and, and, and I was I've got to say I was so disappointed at the route those two lads have taken and it's entirely of course their choice and, and they need to do what's best for them in a, in a short career I thought particularly with Daniel Kelly though he'd barely featured but Rodgers had promised him a berth in the first team he'd be training you know permanently with the mm-hmm. first team squad and I thought it was a real opportunity to stay around to learn under a great coach to to be in the fringes of Champions League football and then take it from there but I thought the two of them were quite sharp to make their decision and I think we're all hopeful that whether it's Daniel Cummins or anyone else that they don't follow suit but that, that that's a challenge for Celtic isn't it how do you mm-hmm. Hold on to these young boys when they're getting you know money and different things yeah, thrown exactly. at them. I think it's very difficult because when you look at Kelly and Vata last season, they actually when you look at it on the surface of it, they didn't actually get a lot of first team minutes uh, mm-hmm. considering. Um, obviously disappointing to see them go down south. Listen, it's players' decision. Um, Vata's been getting some minutes for Watford. Don't think Kelly's had the best time in Millwall so far, injuries and the like. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it has to be a priority for Celtic to make that a thing of the past. These guys who. Are, are coming into the first team and, and not let them go down to England and elsewhere because obviously if they've got the talent and Brendan Rodgers thought Kelly and Vata were decent enough to give mm-hmm. them the minutes that he did um, I think a lot of it is giving the players opportunities um, yeah. in the first team like Daniel Cummings getting him in and around that environment giving him appearances because if he's not going to get that and other clubs are offering that elsewhere I think it's, it's really a no-brainer for the player at that age to go elsewhere and get the minutes but yeah, I really would like to see the club give him a new deal. Um, mm. Obviously, I think it's something that the fans want to see, um, given what I've been reading on social media, etc. And he's obviously getting a lot of hype about him now, given the goal return, which rightly so, because he's been doing so well. But it, yeah, I'd, I'd really like to see the club give him a new deal if they can. Yeah, so so the deal expires at the end of this yeah, season? Yeah, end of this season. Case? Yeah. Um, it, it, as you pointed out, he's just been called up to the, the under-19 squad, so yeah. there's obviously you know people there are recognising what he does. Yeah. Brendan Rodgers, yeah, he did say he wanted his... Kyogo was his main mm-hmm. man at the time. Adam, he does come in as a, a senior striker to provide competition there. And Rocco Vata was earmarked as the the youth player to come and yeah. you know, play play third mm-hmm. fiddle, if you like. Why not, Daniel Cummins? You know, it, it kind of just seems... Uh, don't get me wrong, Brendan Rodgers doesn't seem a manager who's going to give guys minutes for nothing. You yeah. know, you've got to earn yeah. them. But Definitely. it would seem, given on his you know, goal return, as you say, 20 goals and 18 appearances... And Celtic have got a raft of fixtures. There's 10 between now and the turn of the year alone. There would seem like opportunity in there to get him maybe some minutes here and yeah. there off the bench. Yeah, an ultra marathon of fixtures. <laughs> Brendan Rodgers described it as. Um, yeah. So when you've got something like that, like the manager's saying, then definitely there could be an opportunity. Especially Adamida dropping out of the Ireland squad. I'm not yeah. sure what the, the situation is with his fitness. I'm sure we'll hear more at the end of the week when the manager speaks to the media. Mm-hmm. Um, but if one of those strikers, Kyogo or Adamida, gets injured, you're needing someone else. I know the manager has said Dyson Maida can play yeah. that role through the middle. Um, but I don't think there's nothing to say that Daniel Cummins couldn't get a chance. Um, mm. He is a natural striker. My aid isn't a natural striker. Yep. And he's in form. Uh, when you have a striker who's in form scoring goals, mm-hmm. why don't you play him? Why don't you give him an opportunity? Someone who's got 20 and 18 appearances yeah. this season. That's it's quite the return. Uh, no one in the first team, I think, has got 20 goals this season. No. Um, 
So yeah, definitely give him a chance if there is the opportunity there. Obviously, he has to earn it himself. Mm. Um, but there are over the course of these next two months or three, four months, there's going to be games like when you're at Celtic Park on a Wednesday night against lesser opposition where perhaps even you, you give him the nod or you play him for the second half or the, mm. or the last half hour. Um, and that's something I would like to see happen. Yeah, and I think he's he's a young lad. I think fans generally get excited most about strikers rather than yeah, any other position. Yeah. And he's a young lad who is making the headlines. So hopefully um, he shows up well over the next couple of weeks if he's training and hopefully he gets that opportunity. We'll, we'll watch it very closely. Um, another lad who's on the radar is Francis Tully. So he's, yeah. again, 18 years of age. He's from Glentoran over in the north of Ireland. He has signed a new four-year deal. Yeah. So we're, we're safe with, with Francis <laughs> for yeah. now. Uh, he signed that in August after impressing across in the States on pre-season. Mm-hmm. He scored against Queen's Park, was it, or air? Yeah, he scored against Queen's Park, Queen's the Park friendly, yeah. in the friendly, so he obviously kind of made an impression there. And he made his debut, he's made his senior debut off the bench. He came on for Rio Hattati in a 3 0 win over St. Murn in August. Yep. What's your impressions of Francis Turley? Can we get excited about that one? Uh, yeah, I think so. It's, it's a bit of a weird one because he kind of made the jump from the 18s uh, straight to the first team without really playing a lot of B team football. Um, and obviously, the manager sees something in him and enough to warrant that uh, new contract that you just spoke about and give him the first team minutes this season. Um, he's the only academy player to, to make a first team appearance okay. this season. Um, I believe so um, so yeah he looks like a talented midfielder on the ball looks quite technically gifted I think physically there's quite a lot of development still to go there with Francis uh-huh. perhaps that's something the manager spoke about after the, the friend in Sligo a couple of weeks ago mm-hmm. that all these young players coming through that as much as they need, they're good on the ball they need to be physical and they need to have that side of their game to them as well so yep. maybe a bit of development to go for young Francis there but he's still just 18 years of age so mm-hmm. you, at 18 there's, players don't stop developing until 22, 23 and when you have him down on that long-term contract, perhaps if, if there is an injury to a first-team player, like Celtic could have been very lucky this season. Rio Hattati has stayed fit, Paul Bernardo, Arne Engels, Cal McGregor. Mm-hmm. You've got Luke McCown in there. Everyone has stayed fit. Celtic could have yet to really have a crisis of injuries. And the fact these guys are in and around the first team, uh, like Turley is, he's training with them uh, quite a bit, then if there is an injury, then they could he could make the step up, which would be good to see. And obviously the manager's been impressed with him, given the new deal. Yeah. You mentioned there that he's the, at the moment the only academy player to get yeah. minutes, um, which I didn't realise. I did see a graphic doing the rounds. I'm sure you've seen it. Um, and it was shown that basically of, of the various uh, Scottish Premiership sides, Celtic and Rangers certainly performed the worst in terms yeah. of giving guys minutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Motherwell are the top performers, yeah. I think. Um, I think a lot of that's down to Lennon Miller playing a lot of minutes for them. Yeah. I, I was going to ask about Lennon Miller. So we discussed mm-hmm. him last night on our weekly show. He comes up quite a lot at this moment yeah. in time. Uh, you've mentioned that Turley's only 18, uh, Daniel Cummins only 18. But Lennon Miller is also 18, mm-hmm. uh, but playing in a very different environment, but getting lots of valuable experience. I don't know, he's, he's certainly 50 plus games. He's got Mother. 50 plus games for Motherwell senior um, games, yeah. And standing out pretty well. Not only that, he captained Motherwell against Rangers in yeah. the League Cup semi final. There's clearly a lot of faith been put in him. Mm-hmm. What do you think? I hear a lot about, you know, and, and I, I'm friends or know of some people who have got uh, young lads in the Celtic Academy and, yeah. and other academies at this moment in time. And there's a decision for some of these people to make in terms of do you keep your kid at that elite level yeah. knowing that a very small percentage ever actually make it through? Yeah. You know, there's everyone hopes to be the next KT, the next Callum mm-hmm. McGregor, the next James E. Forrest, yeah. but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tall order. Whereas, you know, there's an argument of maybe taking your youngster to a Motherwell or a St Martin or, or, or a club of this nature where there is a far easier route to the first team. Yeah. And I would say Lennon Miller, you know, so ages with Turley and with Daniel Cummins, He's got far more to offer now and his door is, is wide open in terms of what he does next. There is a suggestion that Celtic might come in for him and I'd love to see it. He may well go and follow the the Lewis Ferguson, Josh Doy, Garen Hickey, Italy route. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's got opportunity and that comes through playing games of football. What do you think of the argument for each pathway, Celtic and otherwise? Yeah, I think there's a lot of arguments. I full credit to Stuart Kettlewell and Motherwell for giving Lennon Miller the opportunities that he has and he seems to be flourishing. And like you say, I would certainly love to see him at Celtic Football Club. Um, just on the kind of pathway, I wrote an article the other day, a column for Celtics are here talking about why we aren't seeing a lot of young players get first team opportunities at the club. And in the past decade, only two have really come through and established themselves. That's Kieran Tierney and Cal McGregor mm-hmm. uh, as regular first team starters. And I kind of put it down to three factors um, okay. why we aren't seeing a lot of people get first team opportunities and, and establish themselves. One of them is that there's better opportunities elsewhere. Um, we touched on the kind of moving to, to so-called lesser teams within Scotland and, yep. and getting first-team minutes. Um, but you've also got the lure of bigger teams. Um, ben Doak, I'm sure a lot of people watched him for Scotland last night and on yeah. Friday night. Brilliant. Um, absolutely terrific. I would argue that he's a generational talent yeah. in, in Scottish football. Yeah, maybe he'll be. Um, and he was obviously on the books at Celtic before he made that move to Liverpool. Now, 
very difficult for Celtic to keep a player any yeah. player at any level of the team when Liverpool come calling the same applies to guys like Liam Morrison and Barry Hepburn who moved to Bayern Munich previously yeah. uh, the same applies to Aidan Borland um, who's playing for Scotland 19s the other day and made his debut for Aston Villa after moving to them from Celtic in the summer of 2023 mm-hmm. um, so all these players it's very difficult to stop them going elsewhere Yeah. and um, when you've got those opportunities in your doorstep so that's one factor another factor and this is one Brendan Rodgers spoke about is the structure of Scottish football mm-hmm. um, he basically said that the league was too small yeah. um, and that perhaps if you expanded the league it allows managers to put younger players into the team more often with less pressure on their shoulders mm-hmm. to get results because in a 12 team league Everyone's fighting for everything. You've yeah. got teams fighting for the title, you've got teams fighting for European places, top six, bottom six, relegation, relegation playoffs. Mm-hmm. So, so much going on. Um, yeah. And that's just the structure of senior football. Something I was looking into and I've spoke about to a lot of people within youth football circles is the, the structure of Scottish football between the under-18s level and between uh, the, the senior level. So there is no recognised league above the 18s level youth league in Scotland mm-hmm. um, so you've got Celtic and Hearts B who have teams in the Lowland League Rangers used to they pulled them out uh, and they now play best v best friendlies with their B team which are elite teams yeah, across yeah across Europe and England etc mm-hmm. um, so you've got that and then you've got Dundee and Kilmarnock who are in the SPFL Reserve League which mm-hmm. is a six team league a lot of people don't know about six six teams in that league Jeez, oh, I, I wasn't even aware yeah, of it SPFL Reserve League that tells you how mm-hmm. much uh, people know about it so I think Scottish football could maybe between 18s level and, and B team level you've certainly got players who can still grow a lot Like, yeah. I, and I think Scottish football could perhaps take a look at England where there's the, the Premier League too I'm sure a lot I'm sure yourself will be aware yeah. of that and a lot of listeners will be aware of that where I think there's 25, 26 teams there or thereabouts don't quote me on that um, that are graded as category 1 academies and they play a league season uh, throughout the campaign two games against each other one at home and one away I believe it is, I might be wrong on that. But they've certainly got a league in the Premier League too for under-21 players. It was used to be under-23, okay. but they've pulled it down now to under-21s. Uh, and that basically allows players to play a league season uh, against teams of a similar level, players of a similar age who are developing, and, and it's certainly benefiting clubs in England, teams in England, mm-hmm. both in terms of players' development and financially for the clubs because you've got teams like Man City who are having young players playing that for a season or two, scoring a lot of goals and selling them for £15, £20 million pounds without making a senior appearance. Yeah. So Scottish football could take perhaps a leaf out of that book and organise something maybe. Um, listen, I'm not the guy to, to, to own, uh, suggest radical change. You um, could be that guy. But I couldn't. You never know. Um, too young for that yet. But that could be something they look at. And I think the third factor um, is ability. Aidan McGeady was recently speaking to the Herald at the weekend, mm. done an interview with them and... Um, he's basically saying that it, you have to be good enough to play in the Celtic first team. Yeah. Um, he had to force his way in, and you have to prove that you are a better option for the manager than what the first team players are. Mm-hmm. That's a very difficult task. Um, so ability is another key factor. So I would I'd put it down to ability, the structure of Scottish football, both at senior and youth level, and then the fact that there's better opportunities elsewhere in the lure um, of some of the biggest clubs in Europe. Yeah, and there's quite a lot to unpack there, and they're all really yeah. interesting in their own right. I think the um, the top six structure, you know, twelve yeah. team league, that was brought in to make sure that right up to the death, every game was competitive, more or less, that every team had something to play for. And I think by and large, that that applies. You know, getting into the final game, there's very few dead rubbers in Scottish or the, the Scottish Premiership, whether it's teams fighting for Europe, as you say, to avoid relegation, to finish top six, bottom six, whatever it may be. There's always something to play for. And generally, the out with, say, the top four, you could probably take position six to about 10, 11, maybe even 12 at times, and it's very, yeah, very tight in there. Yep. And a couple of wings, wins can springboard you, and likewise, yep. a, a run of losses can, can put mm-hmm. you back. So from a competitive point of view, I can absolutely see all yep. the thinking behind a 12-team league that splits after, what is it, 32 games, yep. and then plays out. But you've got the, um, the, the other side of that, in that because everything's so cutthroat, so competitive... Managers can't afford to take the risk. I'm sure every manager in the league, from Brendan Rodgers to, I was going to say whoever's bottom of the table, it's Hibs and Hearts, so uh, David Gray and Neil Atkinson, Critchley. Critchley. Yep. So they want to, they would love to bring through the, the, the next Daniel Cummins or Lennon Miller or whatever, but when your job is on the line, you know, every game is important at this level, so when your job's on the line, you're not going to take that risk. And ultimately, that's where the more experienced player will always get the nod over the youngsters. So I think structurally, there's an issue there. I also agree wholeheartedly that because there's this gap between 
under 18s and first team. You know, but back in the day, you'll hear guys of my age and others talk about the old reserve league, and mm. you hear guys like Danny McGrain and other kind of Celtic figures talking about how it was a great grounding for them because they were getting in there at maybe 18, 19, 20 and playing against some real senior pros who had maybe were returning from injury or were trying to get match fitness up. So they were mm. in, at the rough and tumble against some really talented players. I'm not being dismissive of the Lowland League because I know there's some very decent yep, sides in there. Definitely. I know East Kilbride try and play a lot of good football and there's there's other teams around. But you've, you'll have seen more of it than I have. Yeah. Do you feel it's just not the best place to prepare players for, as I say, the, the cutthroat world of, of senior yeah, football well, at Celtic? Well, it's a part-time league at the well, end of the day, is. isn't yeah. it? And that's, I think that's kind of the crux of the argument there with the Lowland League. Like you say, some good teams in the division East Kilbride played, watched them against Air United on yeah, the BBC three last week 3-2 they beat them so yep. against Scott Brown's Air United so there you go mm-hmm. then you've obviously got Caledonian Braves who play, play some nice football at times as well so that's a decent level to be fair but mm-hmm. I think like you say I don't know if it's the best place for Celtic B to be playing yeah it's a real tricky one um, let's go back to some of the Celtic boys who we've yeah. mentioned Daniel Cummins Francis Turley there's a couple of other guys that are, yeah. that are on my radar uh, you can let me know your thoughts mm-hmm. uh, some fans, I'm sure, will remember Mitchell Frame, who made yeah. his debut in the Champions League. Yeah. Some place to do it. Mm-hmm. He came off the bench against Feyenoord um, when Celtic won 2 1, game six, I think it was last season, December yeah. 2023. He's also been capped at Scotland under 19 uh, level, and yeah. he's an 18 year old, as the other two lads are. Um, he's obviously fallen a wee bit back out the picture since being, you know, since featuring mm-hmm. there last year. What do you think of Mitchell Frame? Is has he got an opportunity there to to fill the void at left back if one becomes? Well, listen, I think every time I've watched him, I've been impressed. Um, I think he impressed a lot of people when he came on in that Champions League game against Feyenoord last season, like you mentioned. Um, he played left wing. He can play anywhere in the left hand side, whether it be left back or left wing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one thing with Mitchell Frame is his contract is up next summer. Um, a similar situation to Daniel Cummings. Mm-hmm. Um, that's going by transfer marked, by the way. So if anyone's okay. saying that's not true, you can go and take your complaints to transfer marked. Um, but he's playing consistently for the B team this season, uh, both in the youth league and the Lone league. So mm-hmm. I think he's a good talent. Uh, like you say, he's still young. Um, there's another couple of players I've got on my radar as well. Kobe Donovan's one. Yeah, people will remember him. Played a bit in preseason in the first team, and he was mm-hmm. on the bench for the first team against Falkirk. Okay, uh, in that game. Um, I would describe him as a bit of a silky right back who's good silky on the right ball um, I watched him first got under 19s at the weekend against Liechtenstein where he, where he was key in setting up two of the goals he didn't assist them directly but he was mm-hmm. he made some key passes in the build up to him he's still just 18 he's got two assists in 15 games this season for the B team um, and he, let's say he was key for Scotland under 19s at the weekend so I really mm-hmm. like him looks quite physical for his age as well um, quite a tall player so Really impressed with Colby every time I've watched him, and Sean McArdle is another one. You mentioned um, Sean, yeah. Um, yeah, so just talking about him off here, he's a young, very technically gifted midfielder. Mm. Um, a lot of that comes from his time playing futsal as a youngster. Right, okay. Um, which is quite interesting. He's got is, a, is there a much of a futsal environment around Scotland then? Is it something that's growing? It's, it's, I think it's something that's growing, something that I've seen a bit on social media. Strathclyde Uni, I go to, have got a team, a lot of the unis have a team for it um, and it's it's good for technical ability obviously because you keep the ball on the ground, it's a bit more of a tight space, it's a heavier ball mm-hmm. uh, in futsal so he's had spent a bit of time in that environment and that okay. obviously seems to have benefited him well. He's got a really good left foot on him and he is quite highly rated within the academy. He's still only 17 though so he's not, okay. he's not even 18 until next August. Uh, sorry to perhaps depress some of the listeners but he was born in 2007. Seven. Um, Has he been getting minutes at the B team? Yeah so he's played nine Lowland League games this season, right. two goals in that uh, and he played in the Sligo friendly uh, and set up one of Luis Palma's goals with mm-hmm. a really nice cross where he cut back in his left foot and floated into the back post for Palma. Okay. Um, so yeah Sean McArdle's one that, that I really really like and I think uh, I would earmark as one of the future. The, the other lad that stood out for me, as I say, I went to that Bratislava game and I'm hoping to get along to a few more games because yeah. there's real talent on show and, and yeah. it's entertaining and they obviously mirror the first team in terms of the way they play and I think yeah. Celtic as a club have done that for a number of years now, whether it's through you know, Ange or, or, or various other previous managers. Yeah. There's a lad, you'll be aware, Kyle Ewer, Kyle Ewer. that plays right. centre mid. He's very much in the Callum McGregor type role. He's mm. left footed, I believe, as yeah, well. He, he seems very powerful, he seems very vocal. He's not the skipper, I don't think. No. Um, but he's very yeah. vocal in terms of mm-hmm. what he does and he seems certainly on that day against Bratislava everything seemed to go through him he seemed mm-hmm. to be you know the kind of guy that controlled everything in terms of getting the ball off the defenders and starting every Celtic attack have you been impressed by him is he someone that, that might get minutes yeah, at v- some point very energetic when he gets the ball mm-hmm. um, Kyle you're like you say a bit light in that kind of Callum McGregor mould left foot player sitting deep in the number six role making play happen making things happen and 
was playing for Scotland 19s again at the weekend. Um, I wasn't playing, I think it was on the bench at the weekend when I watched them. Um, but yeah, I've been impressed with them when I've watched them. Um, Kyle, you're in, I was actually walking behind him, walking up the Celtic way, going into the, uh, the game against RB Leipzig a couple mm-hmm. of weeks ago. Um, he captain Celtic's under 18s to the Scottish Youth Cup in 2023. Okay. I think he was 17. Uh, then I'm not sure what age he is now specifically but he captained them and I think he has captained the B team uh, on a couple of occasions this yeah. season Mitchell Robertson is the captain right. um, he's a centre half but yeah, I think Kyle's uh, in, the, in the kind of leadership group there as well so he's been one I've been impressed by as well very energetic in the midfield can get forward and score a goal as well mm-hmm. uh, got a couple this season so yeah he's one uh, I like as well There seems to be a serious Celtic presence certainly under 19 level for Scotland I, yeah. I don't know if, if that is the case at the you know the lowers the 18s the mm-hmm. 16s or whatever, but they seem to very much make up I dare say a core of that team. Is yeah, that the yeah, case? yeah, they do. There's uh, Daniel Cummings, uh, Kobe Donovan, Mitchell Frame, Kyle Ewer. Uh, they seem to be getting a lot of cops. And listen, if you're getting recognised by your country to play, you've got to be good. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a positive. 21 is not much of a presence um, for Celtic players at that level. Uh, even in the senior team, as we've seen at the most recent international break, not much of a presence. Tony yeah. Ralston, kind of the only guy playing. Um, but yeah, there certainly has a big presence in the nineteens, a, a, a good core of Celtic players, which is which is good to see. And like I say, if you're getting recognised by your country, it's only bodes well. It does. It, it, it points us back towards Aidan McGeady's comments that you yeah. mentioned there about you need to have the ability. And I would suggest all these lads that we've mentioned. So we're talking about Daniel Cummins and Francis Turley and Kelly yeah. for a reason. These guys are standing out for a reason. Yeah. And I would argue they've certainly got. Ability, whether they've got enough ability yeah. to, to pull through or not is a different question. But I guess that's why they're at the academy yeah. and, that, and that's why the various coaches there will be working with them to try and harness that ability to improve that you know, technique and, and improve everything they do. Mm. And then I guess it's over to them. I, I, sp- I mentioned off here that I spoke to uh, Greg Robertson, who's a guy that I'm fairly close with. Greg coached in Celtics Academy for around about mm. 18 years. And I do remember one thing that he said uh, when we spoke on, on the show. He said that ability will get you into the Celtic Academy, but it's your attitude and your application yeah. that will keep you there. Yeah. And I wonder if that's the challenge to these guys. that they've clearly. I think anyone that's part of Celtic's Academy, whether you're a, a, a tiny top mm. right up to 18, mm. 19 or whatever, ability gets you in there, but it's it's how, how they apply themselves alongside what the coaches do and how they work with them and that's the yeah. that's the real challenge yeah, for these definitely. youngsters there's a, there's a specific mentality required to play for Celtic isn't there and mm-hmm. I spoke about it earlier the players who've even broke through in recent times Carl McGregor elite mentality yeah. captain of the club James Forrest elite mentality second most decorated player in the club's history yeah I think you're right now yeah. just uh, behind uh, Bobby Lennox yeah. and Kieran Tierney elite mentality as well yeah. um, who's if he didn't have injuries but one of the best left backs in, in the world perhaps mm-hmm. in my opinion um, so yeah you need to have that, that um, mentality and the correct attitude um, for these young guys um, coming through as, as much as it's good if you're a good footballer mm. you need to be switched on not academically switched on maybe but yeah. you need to be switched on enough to, to handle yourself in a senior environment uh, to play well um, and have the correct attitude and not be not be slacking not, not be drinking at the weekend and it is so hard though for young players you know they've got you've got pals you've got mates who are who are out going to the pub on a Saturday night You've you've got a game in the Sunday or you've just played a game in the Saturday and mm-hmm. you need to limit what you do and you need to be switched on and that's what separates the kind of the guys who maybe don't make it and the guys who do and get to that elite level uh, and play for Celtic. I think it's a huge benefit in guys like Steve McManus being around. Stephen's yeah. obviously come through that pathway yeah. and had to do the I'm not going out tonight, I'm going to stay and switched on and yeah. I've I've seen that at first hand over the years. Mm-hmm. Um and he's had his rewards. You know, he's yeah. he's captain Celtic to a couple of titles under Gordon Strack and played yeah. Champions League football. And I think that's why guys like him and Darno Day and Johnny Hayes and stuff being around, aside from their coaching talents, it, it, they can point back to the boys and say, well, listen, we've been where you want to be. And I think that's a great example. But I, I, I really like the point you made on elite mentality. If you look at Callum McGregor, at Kieran Tierney, at James Forrest and also I would argue that Ben Doak will probably fall yeah. in that category yeah. Ben Doak is a very focused and determined young man yeah. he's unfazed by is it Gvardiol it was Gvardiol yeah, I heard he, the interview he's runs the, yeah. a Man City player uh, the other night there and I don't think he cares who he's up against yeah. in fact I actually think he would thrive on playing against better players yeah. You know, he'd be more than happy to step up against whoever it is he's obviously on loan at Middlesbrough just now I think he'll go back to Liverpool and be a huge success but I would argue, without knowing him intimately, I would argue that his attitude is part of that. And the, the aforementioned poster boys for Celtics Academy, KT, Calmack and James Forrest. And I think that's the example of these these young guys. It's not good enough to 
you know, show a bit of skill, score the odd goal, you know, provide an assist here and there, or maybe not even good enough to score 20 goals in 18 games, as is the case of Daniel Cummins. You need so much more than that. Yeah. And I think the elite mentality is a huge part of it. And I hope as well, and I don't know for sure, but I hope as well that at academy level, they also work in the mindset of the players as well as the the technical and tactical side of things as well. Yeah. So we'll see on that. Josh, you also focus on loan players, you know, as part of your coverage. Yep. And there's a number of players out on loan just now, uh, mm-hmm. a combination of first team players and youth players. So let, let me focus on the first team guys initially. You can let me know your thoughts on how they are progressing and then we'll look at some of the youngsters as well. Um, the headlines tend to be from guys like Alessandro Bernabe at this moment in time. He's turning yeah. up in yeah. Brazil for Internacional. The suggestions are, I don't know how accurate or not this is, don't know if it's a Celtic are here story, but Celtic are looking for £8.5 million for him. 8.3, that was the report. From, so there's a report from South America that came out and it was €10 million, Euros, which okay. roughly translates to £8.3 million. Got now just a bit on Bernabe, he's, the, he's got the highest average rating of any player in the Brazilian league, according to Sofa Score, since right. he made his debut. Okay. 7.51 average rating, which is quite incredible. 19 league appearances for Internacional, three mm-hmm. goals and four assists. Um, he's been tipped for an Argentina call up by some people down what, there. One fan uh, tipped him for a Brazil call up. <laughs> I was <laughs> just about to read that out. Yeah, a, a South American based British journalist, Tim Vickery, tweeted out Tim that Vickery, yeah. some Brazilian journalists were saying he should be called up for the Brazilian team until yeah. they didn't realise he was Brazilian, yeah. Yeah, which is which is quite hilarious. And when you look at the player Bernabe was um, at Celtic, he was he was erratic, mm-hmm. he, was, he was poor in his decision making, and he was just simply up to the standard yeah, and, and, and that's why he was, he was shipped out on loan and in South America he seems to be thriving he's been a standout player in the league best left back in the league scoring goals getting assists and he's everything Celtic thought he was going to be mm. at Celtic and I think a combination of the the environment um, South America he's from there yeah. probably the Brazilian Portuguese that is spoken there he's more familiar with that his native tongue than he has English mm-hmm. um, and he's, he's just more assimilated there yeah, and I think a lot of people I've seen on Twitter and social media and the like are X talking about 8.3 million Celtic are robbing Internacional if that's the case I don't think they are and because if Celtic were going to sign a player who's the best left back in the Brazilian league currently mm-hmm. who's been tipped for Argentina call-ups and even Brazil call-ups even though he's not Brazilian yep. that's the price you would be looking to pay and you'd yeah. be even looking to pay a wee bit more than that and mm-hmm. Bernabe also has caps for Argentina's youth teams as well so I think 8.3 million is absolutely fair to ask for Bernabe. One point, though, I would say is it's a decision to make for Celtic. So, mm-hmm. obviously, the left-back situation, Taylor's contract's up at the end of the season. Valle's loan's up at the end of the season. Um, Bernabe, so do they bring him in? Do they give him that chance? Mm. Or, do, or do they sell him when he's at his peak value? Because I don't think his value's going to get any more than that. And yeah. when he returns to Celtic, if he plays, you risk decreasing that value. Mm-hmm. So, for Celtic, it's about selling him when he's at that peak. When else are you going to get £8.3 million for a player like yeah. Bernabe? Probably never. So, if I was Celtic in January... I would try and sell him for the, the largest fee you can and reinvest that money back into, say, a winger or another left back. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think you cash in. I yeah. think he's at peak value if that's the, the figures doing the rounds. I also think just more generally in football, you find that some players just find an environment that works for them. I think that there's an example on our doorstep in terms of Adam Eder. He's not having a great time right now, but what you've seen last year, he was clearly way out the picture at Norwich. I don't know if he was third choice striker or even further behind mm-hmm. than that. And he arrived at Celtic in January and he just tore it up. He yep. was sensational for Celtic. He played a huge part, in my opinion, in winning the league. Yep. He obviously played a massive part in winning the Scottish Cup final with his his goal on the day. And I think just different environments suit different players. And, and how often have we seen players arrive at Celtic with big pedigree, big reputation, just doesn't work out. You know, that, that that's quite a common story. And I think you've also got another example in the shape of Nicholas Kuhn. Yep. He's a young guy with serious talent. He represent or has represented Germany, I think, everywhere up to under 18, if not under 20 level. He's been at some big clubs. He was at Ajax. He was at Bayern, Bayern Munich. He was at uh, Rapid Vienna before he came to Celtic and just couldn't quite find his niche. Couldn't quite fit in, despite the fact that a lot of these clubs have looked at him and thought, this guy's got a talent, let's give him a chance. And for whatever reason, it's worked in Celtic's favour because he's landed at Celtic Park Whereas, again, I put a lot of this down to working under a coach like Brendan Rodgers. He's absolutely thrived, and this is the right environment for him. And maybe just, you know, as you say, Bernabe is in the right place for him at this moment in time. So I think it would be the right move to to cash in. But it's good to see him do well. It's always a positive for Celtic. There's a few other guys. um, Mixed news, I have to say. Mm -hmm. Um, You can catch these in whatever order you'd like to. There's Mm -hmm. Gustav Lagerbielka at FC Twente. There's Quan at Hibs, who are Mm -hmm. having a terrible time. 
And there's Marco Tello, who very unfortunately has picked up another injury at Melbourne City. Any take on, on how those lads are doing? Yes, yeah, so Lager Bell, he seems to be enjoying it though. At 20, going by his comments uh, in the media, he's, he's like you say, he's not played that much. He's got six appearances in total. He's only made one start. That came away to Nice in the Europa League. So he's he seems to be enjoying it though, which is the kind of main thing. And if, if he's someone Celtic can go off the books permanently next summer, then I think that'd be probably the best thing to do. Mm-hmm. Marco Tello, it's difficult. Um, he scored on the opening day of the A-League season for Melbourne City. They won uh, away at Newcastle Jets, I believe it was. But on the 7th of November, we sit here recording this on the 19th, mm-hmm. he got a partial hamstring tear uh, mm-hmm. to his left hamstring and he's going to be out for six to eight weeks. So it's difficult for him. He seems to be plagued with injuries. Um, yeah. Marco Tello, the, the other guy he spoke about there is Quan, struggling with most Hibs players this season. They sit bottom of the table. Uh, he showed flashes on loan at St Mirren last season. Yeah, he played pretty well until he got a significant injury. Kind of kept him out for the remainder of the campaign. He was called up for South Korea's senior team earlier in the season. Mm-hmm. And he didn't start too badly. Ten league appearances, but Hibs, they're just an absolute basket case at the minute. Yeah, yeah, he's, it's hard to flourish in, in that type of yeah. environment. But I, I do think there's something about Quan, whether he, he ends up being good enough for Celtic remains to be seen but I think he's got something about him yeah. I, I, I use this term a lot you know he's got something about him and then no end of folk are like well what exactly has he got about him I'm like well, I don't know but he's got something yeah. Um, I think Lager Bielka that you mentioned he seems a good character I don't think he's a disruptive influence I think he got very little game time at Celtic but he seemed to be the kind of guy and Roger spoke highly of him in terms of a guy who just turns up works hard and he's available when called upon I don't think that will be the case at Celtic though I think he'll move on whether it's to 20 or elsewhere who knows about Quan and Marco Tillio Again, we've seen the flashes of, of what he can offer, not so much in a Celtic shirt, but some of his highlights at Melbourne City after he went back on loan there. He came off the bench for Celtic last season in a couple of kind of must-wins. Yeah. We, we threw him in and yeah. I think it was a bit unfair mm. on the player. Um, but again, whether he's robust enough for, for what we need and whether he's ultimately talented enough, it remains to be seen. The one other guy who's catching some headlines is Johnny Kenny yeah. over in the, the League of Ireland. He's... I think top scorer for Shamrock Rovers and scoring goals in Europe for them and some great goals. I'm sure you've seen some of the clips. We've asked the question if Daniel Cummins could be the third striker. If it's not Cummins, could it be someone young and talented like Johnny Kenny? I, th- I think there's a case for it, yeah. It's his second season on loan at Shamrock uh, Rovers in Ireland. Uh, they narrowly lost out in the title this year. They won it last year uh, in 2023. So you get 13 goals and three assists in 29 games in the Irish top flight. Now, that doesn't seem like the greatest return, but given his minutes, it's a goal or assist every 106 minutes. Okay. Which is quite good considering games last 90 or more than that. Uh, he's got two goals in three Conference League games this season, Europa Conference League. He's due back at Celtic at the end of the year uh, after Shamrock Rovers Europa Conference League campaign ends. Mm-hmm. Their manager, Stephen Bradley, has kind of stated his desire to sign Kenny up uh, again and keep him at the club. But he's contracted at Celtic into the summer of 2026. 21 years old and like you say going by some of his clips he looks pretty quick quite much of a clinical striker uh, and Celtic kind of signed him when he was a bit younger 18 under Ange Postacoglu mm-hmm. uh, and he's had a couple of loan spells elsewhere Queen's Park he was at as well um, and now obviously Shamrock Rovers but he's kind of flourished and come into his own over the past uh, year which is great to see so yeah I think maybe he could be someone we've seen it with Liam Scales a player out on loan who Many people didn't really think had a future, a long term future at Celtic. He mm-hmm. goes to Aberdeen, albeit Scotland is a bit of a higher level than Ireland, no disrespect. He performs well, comes back, and there's an injury, and he takes the opportunity. So, yep. could Johnny Kenny be that guy? He goes out, does well on loan at Shamrock Rovers. Perhaps if there's an injury to Kyogo Radamida, he comes in and, and perhaps takes his opportunity. Yeah, and the, that pathway you mentioned for Liam Scales, you can also put Ryan Christ into that bracket, yeah. and Chris Iyer, guys yeah. who have gone to other clubs in Scotland and definitely developed. Johnny Kenny, I think he was quoted in the last couple of weeks as saying he was pretty disappointed at the lack of contact from yeah. Celtic. Mm-hmm. And without knowing for sure one way or another, I think that's poor form if that's the case. I think there should be a responsibility for someone at the club. So, someone, in fact, is it maybe Darnold? Darnold Darn is the, the loan and pathway management. So whether it's Darn manager. or someone as part of his team, someone's got to be keeping in touch with the player, even just to say, we're monitoring your progress, you're doing well, or maybe you're not doing well, whatever, but you need to communicate with guys, yeah. otherwise you end up with very unsettled players but whether they're going to make it or not I think there's a duty of care particularly when these guys are at a young age 21 years yeah, of age is a, is a exactly. young man I think you've got to make sure that you're staying connected to your various players whether they're playing in your first team or, or elsewhere at any given time Yeah, the, the specific quote was I think it's just a text here and there is what Johnny Kenny said mm. which which is not the most encouraging to hear is it? It's not great it's not great to be honest with you um, I've mentioned there as I say five players Bernabe, Lager Bielka Quan Tilio, Johnny Kenny Um Put you on the spot. Do any of those guys have a genuine future at Celtic Park, in your opinion? Bernabe, 
could, given that he's played well. Um, but I think he'll probably be sold. Johnny Kenny, again, could. Mm-hmm. Marco Tillion Lager Bielka, I would say no. And the Quan? Quan. Like you say, I think there's something about him, something, isn't there? Isn't it's it's a wee bit, but what is that? Yeah, something no, it's, it's a wee bit like Yang Hyun Jun, who this season's kind of showed him flashes, uh, mm-hmm. even in that Leipzig game that he done, he done pretty well. I think Quan just, it, I don't think Hibs is the right fit for him, given the way things are at the minute at mm-hmm. the club. Maybe it's somewhere where Celtic look to get him back in January, recall him, and then find him another loan elsewhere in Scotland. Yeah, I, I've always thought it's so important. The, the partnerships that Celtic yeah. have got and the clubs that they put people to because we've spent a bit of time there on the fact that Alessandro Bernabe, Bernabe whether by luck or design has found himself at a good environment yeah. and, and listen, I think most anticipated Hibs having a better season than, than they are having yeah. which is fine that's how football goes but I wonder if, if Darnaldy or others, others at Celtic review this and say okay Quan would be better suited finishing out the campaign at I don't know Aberdeen or somewhere in the Championship or, and it leads me on to the next kind of group of players, mm-hmm. Admiral Wacker in Austria, where there seems to be a good partnership in there. Yeah. There does seem to be some players flourishing at a decent level there. So right now, two youth players on loan there is Matthew Anderson and Ben Summers. I believe Matthew's a fullback, yeah. and Ben Summers, who was around the first team a wee bit under yeah. Ange, is a, a midfielder. What do you think about what those young lads are doing out there in Austria? Yeah, I think they're doing pretty well. Matthew, it's his second season at the club. He was named in the Austrian second tiers team of the season last season um, Admira currently sit top of the table okay. in the Austrian second tier at the time of recording um, and Summers and Anderson have been quite key to their success like you say Anderson's a left back he's an attacking left back before he went out on loan he was captain of Celtic's B team a couple of times and this season he's got one goal and one assist uh, from left back which is decent and last season he got seven goal contributions in 22 games okay. uh, from left back which is quite a good return Summers has, has made a good impact in the short um, game time he's kind of had he's got two goals in five games both of them are 20 years of age. Uh, Summers is contracted 2026. Uh, this is by transfer mark check again. Mm-hmm. And Anderson 2025, which is next summer. So that's quite interesting that his contract is Celtic expires when the loan expires at Admira Vaca. So maybe mm. that's something the club should maybe look at. But I really like Anderson. Yeah. Um, he came on pre season, I believe it was, a couple of times. I've seen some people kind of comparing him to Kieran Tierney online and on Twitter, which is a, that's what people do. But yeah. I think that there was <coughs> shades of it. Uh, to be fair to him and he's willing to get forward they look solid at the back and, and Ben Summers in midfield is a goal threat and like he says he's already made his senior debut mm-hmm. uh, under Ange Postacoglu at Rugby Park I believe it was he came on with Rocco Vata that day Okay. Um, so yeah the guys out there are doing well and it, it seems to be a good environment it's a, it's a partnership the club just built up not summer there but the summer before that mm-hmm. um, with Ad Miravaka and they could get promoted this season then that would further strengthen that partnership with Celtic yeah. to have a team who are in the Austrian Bundesliga mm-hmm. um, partnered with Celtic that they can send players out on loan to but so far uh, Anderson and Summers are they're doing pretty well out there I think that seems to be a good fit in terms of a partnership and it's good for these young guys as well as playing at a decent level of football just to experience life and culture elsewhere I think it helps you know Ange will always talk about coach the person first then the player you know yeah. person then, then footballer and I think those experiences are, are pretty good for these lads as well and I also think if we're trying to pitch a, a pathway to the first team for certain young guys it might be that you know if you get to 18 and you've reached certain markers we'll get you a loan move to Austria or otherwise and then if you hit certain markers there you can come back into the first team and be part of that because so we've spoken about the striking berth so you've got in order Kyogo Ida blank at this moment in time yep. whether it's Daniel Cummins whether it's Johnny Kenny there's an opportunity for somebody there yep. and I think at left back there's a similar opportunity where you've got at the moment Greg Taylor and Alex Bailly kind of vying out for first yeah. and second choice but there's a gap after that Yeah, could that be Matthew Anderson or could it be Mitchell Frame or one of yeah. these guys I think there's an opportunity there at left back especially because Taylor's contract's up in the air at the minute mm-hmm. and Bailly whether Celtic are going to sign him permanently remains to be seen mm-hmm. so at this point in time Celtic have got no left back for next season mm-hmm. just based on at this moment in time as we speak yeah. So there is an opportunity there for someone, whether it be Anderson, whether it be Frame. Um, maybe it comes to a situation where in pre-season, if Taylor's contract situation isn't resolved and Alex Vai's loan is not made permanent, mm-hmm. you're, you're starting a Mitchell Frame or a Matthew Anderson in pre-season. Yeah. And that could be a massive opportunity, as we've seen in the past with players playing well in pre-season and then going on to establish themselves throughout mm-hmm. the campaign. Nicholas Kuhn played well in pre-season. He yep. just established himself and he's having a brilliant season, the season of his life. So maybe that's an opportunity for someone to look at next summer. I also think in football, and you hear these stories over the years, that there's so many sliding doors moments where yeah. 
you need that opportunity whether maybe unfortunately the guy in front of you gets injured or he gets sold at short notice and all of a sudden you're in I think you know just the example that jumps to my head is um goalkeeper David David Marshall David Marshall gets picked yeah. against Barcelona because yeah. Rob Douglas gets sent off and all of a sudden David Marshall has a game of his life against one of the best mm -hmm. clubs in the world and forges out a pretty good career the alternative could have been Rab Douglas doesn't get sent off Marshall kicks his heels and then maybe or maybe doesn't make it and that could be the case for some of these guys and I suppose the whole kind of mantra is you need to be ready for when the opportunity comes yeah. it might come tomorrow it might not come for six months might not come at all but when it comes, you need to be ready for it and that's a challenge yeah, for these young players. I think a big thing about that in terms of being ready is patience. Mm. Um, and when you're sitting at a club like Celtic as a young player waiting for a senior opportunity, given that there's not a lot of people getting chances, it can be so difficult. But if you think you're good enough, then perhaps patience is, patience is a virtue, as we know. <laughs> Maybe that's something the players need to have. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's so difficult when you're sitting at Celtic and the number of players... They're getting first team opportunities over the past couple of years has been so so low. Yeah. Um, so I can understand um, perhaps why people are, are I, I also think at 18, 19, 20, you always think you should be starting games. Whether you're right or not yeah. is a different story. But in your head at that age, particularly yeah. if you've got the talent that some of these young players have got, you feel you should be playing first team football and being patient is maybe easier said than done yeah. for these young guys. The, the last guy I want to touch on, we've obviously covered various players, Josh, but mm -hmm. a guy that I really liked when he came through at first, again under Ange, and he's now back from injury, which is great to see, is Dane Murray. Yeah. I think he's a very classy defender. He's He's got height. He's, he seems like yeah. a big, powerful guy. He's at Queen's Park on loan just now. I don't know ages. He must be 20, 21. 21. 21. Yeah. Um, I think he's playing regular for Queen's Park, which is good yeah, to yeah. see. And Celtic do seem to have a good partnership with them as well uh, in the Championship. As I say, been very unlucky with injuries, but from what you know, does does he seem a guy that might come back into the fold? Yeah, I'm quite a fan of Dane. Uh, when I seen him, obviously came through under Ange Postecoglou, been told to play out from the back constantly as a young player when he was making his senior debut. It would have been quite difficult, yeah. especially in key Champions League qualifiers. Eh? But I thought Michelin, he, yeah. he, he coped pretty well at that time, to be honest. Obviously, injuries. Uh, I think he spent over round about two years out, maybe just under two years yeah. out with injuries. So I think the key for Dane right now at this moment in time is just to get games and minutes. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's been doing at uh, Queen's Park. He won the Player of the Month award for October, great. Um, which was great to see. Um, and obviously, like you say, he does have something about him. <laughs> we'll refer back <laughs> to that point again. Um, but we can define what there is about Dane Murray that's height, that's ability on the ball. And it, it looks like he can defend pretty well. And he captain Celtic against Dade United for a bit of that first team friendly at okay. the beginning of the season. He didn't yeah. lead the team out, but I think he did have the armband at some point, I mm -hmm. recall. Um, so, yeah, maybe. At 21 he's missed out on some crucial years of development obviously mm -hmm. when he was out injured but at the same time he still seems to be doing pretty well with Queen's Park and I think yet again on transfer mark contracts up next summer Okay. Um, but if he proves himself and continually proves himself then maybe there's a spot in the team for him obviously Scottish so homegrown player Yeah. Uh, and so we need a lot of them from Europe yeah, absolutely that can play a part in terms of what Brendan Rodgers so he'll be working closely with Paul Tisdale who's a new yeah. head of football operations and that'll very much be quite high up in their, their priority list in terms of making sure there's enough homegrown talent coming through but in terms of Dan Murray uh, first and foremost I hope he stays injury free um, you know just for, for the player himself and hopefully he can have an impact yeah. um, as I say Josh we've covered various players there and there's there's a lot going on between the youth mm -hmm. players and the opportunities they might get the loan players and, and whether or not they've got a future at Celtic of, of any sort but as we start to close things out I've mentioned Paul Tisdale um, it remains to be seen what changes he might apply. You know, maybe he'll change or, or find new loan partners, yeah. a, a new pathway to the first team. I wonder if they might instigate for change in terms of how Scottish football does things at, at youth and reserve level. You know, various things of that that nature. But again, I'm going to put you in the spot. If you have free reign, if you're Paul Tisdale or you've got a role of, of that nature, yeah. what do you do? What terms would you make, if possible, at youth level and also how we operate our loan players at Celtic yeah big time you put me on the spot <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I was prepared for that um, I think there's a lot of things you can do because obviously Celtic's academy mission statement uh, when you go on the club's website uh, is to produce the next generation of Champions League players Okay. now if we look at the past what, 10 years as I alluded to previously they've only produced two players who've gone on to play first team football for Celtic uh, Cal McGregor Kieran Tierney, regular first team football mm -hmm. Cal McGregor, Kieran Tierney and you've also had Ben Doak so I would argue that's three Champions League players level okay. players in 10 years is that living up to the mission statement I'll leave that to, to the listener's imagination I would say not mm -hmm. so that would suggest there needs to be change yeah. um, and if 
if I was in charge, I just think it's so difficult because it's such a complex issue. Yeah. Youth football, I think definitely there needs to be probably a bit of a, a reformat uh, between under-18s and senior level. And there's obviously not a, a lot of structure there in Scottish football. So that's something it, a lot of people like, have slowly seen that graphic or the, the start on percentage of young players. Perhaps there's a rule to be put in place by the SFA. Perhaps there's a restructure of the league. I'm not entirely sure. Um, at the end of the day, I'm not the guy to kind of propose change. I'm the guy who just reports the stats, reports the figures, reports what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's for the higher ups to look at, and that's why Paul, Paul Tisdale was appointed at the club to take on a lot of football operations. Uh, I think it was a, a very interesting appointment. He seems yeah. to be a very interesting guy, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing what he can bring while at the club. I think him and Brendan are two probably similar personalities, uh -huh. um, and I'll be interested to see if he can perhaps be the one to, to springboard Celtics Academy back into life. Yeah, I, I listened to a podcast that was doing the rounds, like, what was it called, like Sporting Business? Yeah, or, I listened to that. Something like that. Yeah. And it was very interesting. He's quite a he's quite a quirky character. He's a confident yeah. guy. He's, mm -hmm. he's got this whole thing about how he dresses and he's leading from example yeah. in the sidelines, all that stuff. You can see why him and Bre Brendan Rodgers might mm -hmm. uh, be on the same wavelength. But I think ultimately, whether it was Paul Tisdale or, or someone else, I believe that someone had to come into a role of that nature for Celtic because... Too many things had fallen through the cracks. The, the Mark Lowell appointment for a variety of reasons didn't work out. And I think it's... Uh, we've obviously spoken in depth here for 45 minutes or so about the youth pathway and the, the loan pathway, which is a different route back to Celtic's first team. But they're so important in their own right. And I'm sure it'll be fairly high up in the, the priority list for, for Paul Tisdale and others within his team to try and find solutions. Just finally, in terms of the loan approach, as I mentioned, got the good relationship with Admiral Wacker in, in Austria. Mm -hmm. Queen's Park and, and probably a couple of other clubs. Do you like the way Celtic operate in that way just now or, or would you like to see that expand? Maybe some more European clubs to partner up with? Yeah, or? I think it's quite good to be fair. When I look at other clubs across Europe, obviously Salzburg have got a good relationship with uh, Liffering as their kind of feeder club okay. uh, in the second tier in Austria, although they're not playing too well at the minute, Liffering. Um, they've got a partner. I think partner clubs are successful to a lot of the top. Uh, teams at the top level and yeah it's only good yeah, I think Admiral Acker particularly is an interesting one because like you said earlier it allows the players to go out to Austria learn a new language learn a new way of living mm -hmm. uh, in a foreign country abroad uh, and that'll only mature them especially when they're at that 18, 19, 20, 21 years of age because I'm sure for anyone of that age mm -hmm. listening, going out living abroad working abroad uh, having to cook your own dinners do your own washing would be it's a daunting task in itself never mind playing well uh, so yeah it's, I think that's only positive for the young players development I'm sure mm. that's something the club's looked at and even closer to home having the relationships with clubs like Queen's Park like you say is, is definitely only positive as well because it gives players the opportunity to go and play within Scotland if they just need consistent minutes like mm -hmm. Dane Murray for example Yeah. Um, so yeah I think that they're good and I would like to maybe I, I don't know if it's worth getting a couple more kind of in Europe maybe just focusing solely on the Admiral of Acker one because mm -hmm. um, it looks like they could get promoted this season if they keep up their form and I would, I would like to see them get that because like I said earlier Celtic having a partnership with a club who are then in the Austrian Bundesliga yeah. could only be positive yeah it's, it's really interesting and, and I dare say we'll start to see the, the workings by Paul Tisdale in, the, in the, the months ahead hopefully we'll start to see some positive updates and, yeah. and we'll you know, we'll be able to track these players that we've spoken about today and maybe some other players will come at the fore as well. But it's, it's a very interesting time um, and let's see what happens there. Josh, we'll start to close things out. Um, I'd ask you for your kind of final comments. It's obviously quite a broad topic mm -hmm. and there's a lot to yeah. it, but your final comments in general on on how Celtic do things at, at youth and, and loan level and also where folks can find you if they want to find some more news from you online. I'd say on loan players, there's a lot of talent uh, out there. Guys are impressing, guys are playing well, uh, and there's people who could come back and get an opportunity and springboard into the first team. But equally, there's people out there like Alejandro Bernabe who could make Celtic a decent sum of money. Mm -hmm. On the academy, I think there's not enough players coming through the academy yeah. and playing for the first team. Uh, that's evident in the numbers, um, and something has to change, something has to give. Um, it's very difficult, it's a complex issue, I know that. Um, that's my take on it. Uh, if you want to find me, you can find me. I think I'm at JoshMCC underscore five on all the socials, Twitter, Instagram, Blue Sky, Blue Sky. Uh, as, as I'm sure everyone's aware of, but now yeah. TikTok as well. Okay. Uh, and obviously the loan page is at Celtic Wild Updates uh, on Twitter. Also do a lot of work for Celtics Are Here, um, news writing, CelticsAreHere.com. That's all the latest news, so check that out. Check out our YouTube channel, everything um, Celtic related. 
brilliant. So if you're not already following Josh, you'll find him in the various places on social, Blue Sky included, uh, and also the loan updates. You'll find that Celtic YL updates updates on Twitter. Josh, brilliant to have you here today. Great to chat all things Celtic. And let's do it again soon. Great. Thank you, Tino. Really enjoyed it. Cheers.